In the Gotti case, mafia experts John Miller, James LaRosa, Ed McDonald, and Jerry Capisi on the new political paradigm, Joe Klein, Elaine Comerick, and James Pinkerton, and as I said, Elvis Mitchell later to talk about movies and what's going on in Hollywood. But first, reputed mobster John Gotti has been acquitted three times in New York City, but this time around he may not be so lucky. Earlier this week, Gotti's right-hand man, Sammy the Bull Gravano, has turned state's evidence, and he plans to testify against Gotti. Here to talk about this stunning development of mafia experts, John Miller of WNBC News, defense attorney James LaRosa, former federal prosecutor Ed McDonald, and Daily News columnist Jerry Capisi. Welcome. Any, any of that introduction serve well? I think it's served accurately yeah, you, right it, around. It, it, what's interesting is you all know each other. This is a constant conversation. You reporting, you're constantly being called on to talk about it. Jerry writes a column, and you as an attorney. Who, um, I think we all know each other very well. Here is my, my first question, really, and, and I'll turn to John. Why did he do this? I mean, tell me who Sammy the Bull Gravano is, and why did he do what he's done? Sammy the Bull Gravano is really the day-to-day -day manager of the Gambino crime family. Uh, when you're talking about the position of underboss, it's, it's, uh, the boss's entire agenda is for insulation. He doesn't want to be meeting with people one-on-one. -on -one. He doesn't want people being able to testify against him. So his marching orders are really carried out day-to-day -day by the underboss, who knows what everybody's doing, what operations are going on, who has a hand in what. He is uh, probably, of anyone, you could make a deal with the guy who could do the most damage to a crime family. Especially, especially yeah, yeah, in this very. case, because uh, in, the, in the Gambino crime family, John Gotti took over in 1986, right after the killing of Paul Castellano. And Sammy the Bull basically came from the Castellano wing, or that faction of the, of the, of the crime family. Enabling Gotti Enabling to, to consolidate his power. To consolidate, right, and to find out, in other words, Gotti had to find out who do I own? What companies do I have? Mm -hmm. And, you know, what have I got? And Sammy Bull helped, uh, you know, John Gotti find that out. So why is a guy, what kind of pressure would the feds have used? I don't know whether they had to use very much <laughs> at all. In fact, uh, uh, under the law, uh, once he had counsel, and of course he had counsel a moment once he was indicted, the, the feds were not permitted to speak to him. I think that, and I don't know what happened, I would imagine this is something that, that, that he did on his own, maybe through family Why members. would he do it? Because he was afraid he was going to die in prison. He's sitting there looking at, at 50 years, 60 years in prison. He knows that, that many of the mobsters in the last five or five or six years have gotten uh, uh, substantial prison terms, and he's looked at people like uh, Philly Rostelli, who was the, uh, the boss of the Bonanno crime family who recently died in prison, looked at Paul Castellano, uh, Paul, uh, Paul Vario, who died in prison. Paul Castellano from, died on the streets. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, he sees that these people are, are, you have actually died in prison. He's in his mid-40s. He's looking at 40 or 30 or 40 years in prison, and he says, what's going to happen to me at the end? I'm going to die. Yeah. I'm going to die in jail. And I think it's just something he didn't want. I think he probably was living in luxury for the last few years and was comfortable, and he just, he just wasn't as tough yeah. as the old-timers. And what happens to the so-called omerta or code of silence here? Obviously, it doesn't exist very well. Uh, I think he might have done John Gotti a favor, though. Why? Long range. I think that they now have a witness that Al Krieger, who's John Gotti's lawyer, can cross-examine effectively. I think that they have another presentation to make to this jury, not just the tapes that they were trying to defend against. I don't think the ball game's over yet. John, do you agree with that? I think uh, that the prosecution uh, has a real balancing act because, as Ed McDonald will tell you, um, they have their own baggage. The question is, how heavy is this bag? And the baggage is the, the, is the, the, track, the criminal record of Gravano and, and how he might be, uh, his, his testimony might not be credible. It's uh, not that it wouldn't be credible. They are With likely to, to believe jury. everything he says, but they may be just so repulsed by the idea that he's getting the deal after all he admits to on that witness stand that they reject the entire case. It's a, it's a theory that actually Ed calls jury nullification. Yeah. But it depends on how, how good a deal Sammy the Bull got. And I'll tell you, Ed McDonald's only two years out of, out of the business, and I'll bet you that he'd like to go into court with Sammy the Bull Gravano testifying against John Gotti, especially well, with what's on those tapes. Yeah. Well, I, yeah. I mean, he well, can tell explain, me about the tapes. Well, on the tapes, they talk about murder after murder after murder that they get involved in together. Mm -hmm. Granted that most of the murders on the tapes, as far as I, I, I've been able to hear, uh, pertain to murders that John Gotti authorizes after Sammy Bull comes to, comes to John and says, hey, John, I want to whack this guy, I want to whack this guy. In fact, there's one conversation where John says, 
hey, what is it with you? You want to whack everybody you're in business with. But I think that is Sammy Is that the term Bull, he uses, whack? Yeah. Uh, that's, yeah. yeah, that's, I think, one of the key terms that, uh, that yeah. they use when they're referring to killing people. But I think um, uh, any prosecutor would love to have one of the guys who's on tape explaining to the jury exactly what it was they were talking about when they talked about whacking, uh, uh, you know, Di Bernardo or Louis de Bono or Well, Jerry, I think <clears throat> if the tapes are clear, then I think Jimmy is right that, that uh, the, the government is really creating problems for itself. Uh -huh. I mean, if you don't have any sort of confusion or ambiguity on the tapes, and the tapes speak for themselves, then you're not going to need somebody like Gravano, and you hurt your case by calling Gravano. But if they're talking about Joey, and it could be any number of ten Joeys, and if they're talking in mm -hmm. terms of maybe they use some other expressions other than whack and some other you know, sort of slang, and uh, cl a clever defense lawyer can suggest, well, they really weren't talking about that. I mean, people all the time are saying, oh, I'm going to kill my kid. My kid's uh -huh. driving me crazy. You don't really mean to kill your kid. And clever lawyers can come up with arguments and create confusion and ambiguity. And if, that, if that's what the tapes are like, then they might need a Gravano to say who they were talking about and what they were talking about and when. But uh, if the tapes are crystal clear and, 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 you can, and you know who they're talking about and the government can convince the jury who they were, about who they were talking about and what they were talking about, then, you, then they're harmed by calling somebody like Gravano. So answer Jim's case. W would you, in fact, like to have him, or, or I guess it was Jerry that made the point, if you were prosecuting this case, would you want to have Sammy the Bull as a witness? Well, I hate to beg off. I mean, I'd like to know. I don't know the, the details of the case. I don't know the details of the tapes. And I haven't you know, spoken to Gravano. I mean, Gravano could be, he could, he could prove to be a terrible witness. I mean, he could know everything. We had people, you know, informants come in and turn and cooperate who we didn't call as witnesses. We had other witnesses who were absolutely, you know, you would look at them and you would think they were reprehensible. You would think that they were, you know, dumb as stones. I mean, Henry Hill was a guy who was a right. perfect example. Henry Explain Hill, who Henry Hill is. Henry Hill was the, the, uh, good uh, the, the and mobster. The guy from whom Wise Guys. We, yeah, the, the, the story was, was, was based on. It was a true story. And uh, Henry was, uh, I mean, barely articulate. I mean, he was, you would think that he would be a terrible witness. And he was. On the witness stand, he was a terrible witness. But he had some quality about himself that he, he was able to just, you know, produce conviction after conviction after conviction. And you never know. I mean, it, it's a crapshoot sometimes. You just don't know how a jury is going to react to a witness. Sam Gravano is going to bring a lot of luggage into this courtroom. What's a lot the luggage? Of, a lot of vicious crimes that he's committed by himself. And the jury's going to hear this. And c clever defense lawyers like Al Krieger are going to bring it out. They're going to bring out every piece of the detail. And they call Gravano the bull for a reason. Because he's got a thick neck, he allegedly takes steroids, he looks like a bull, and Gotti's going to come into that courtroom looking like a sleek greyhound. And, and uh, people are going to say what, you well, think? Well, they never root for the bull. They never <laughs> root for the bull. Yeah, well, the, another problem he has, though, <laughs> is, that you, is that, and mostly from John's, uh, John's shows, they're going to have, the government will be able to have tape after tape after tape of John Gotti walking down the street with the bull. And the, and the jury is going to sit there and they're going to say, if he is so bad, what was John Gotti doing with him day in and day out? And the government has surveillance tapes yeah. and they're on tape John. talking together. What's Gotti's reaction? I mean, did we know what he said about this? No, but I think everybody's reaction about Gotti's reaction is the same, which is, I would have loved to have been a fly <laughs> on the wall when, when somebody <laughs> told him. Um, I think the extension of Gotti's reaction, which always flows from the lawyers, is interesting because if you listen to the lawyers' rhetoric building up to this, they were always saying, but, you know, these are men. These are good men. John Gotti, Sam Gravano, Frank Lacasio, these are, you know, solid guys. Well, I mean, they've been building up Sam Gravano as, yeah. uh, as quite a character, and they're going to be backpedaling on that for a long time and very quickly. Is, if, if Gotti... Is there, how serious, how significant, how would you characterize the effort to convict John Gotti? Oh, it's been monumental. <laughs> I, I mean, know. It, it's, it's, you know, he's been target number one, public enemy number one, ever since he was acquitted of racketeering charges in 1987. This in very 1987. move is so demonstrative of that because you have to say, well, we always, we always use the little fish to catch the bigger fish. Yeah. But when you start cutting deals on the level of underboss, yeah. I mean, that's the second biggest fish in the sea. Um, you're using some very big fish to catch other big fish. Well, they must really they've, they've, they've used three, uh, they've they're, used underbosses before, yeah. and we've, th five or six weeks ago, we had a boss. Yeah, they're not, yeah. Uh, they're not looking come at into him. The, come into the, you know, cross the line and go on the other side. Yeah, well, so. he's important. He's probably even more important in the long run 
about other things he can tell them. I mean, if, he tur if it turns out that he's, but in a, he's a worse guy, guy in this case in than the, Gotti is. Yeah, but what's he going to do about the future? What can he tell them about? I mean, he can take down, if he's an articulate and a bright witness and he has a good memory and he can, and he can lead them to all the unions and all the businesses that they've controlled, and he can get up there and he can lead them to corroboration and then testify about it and about the operations of other families and about the operations of all of the associated people, the businessmen, if there are politicians who are associated with them, labor union officials, it goes on and on and on. He was in a position to know. He is in a position to know. So he could be far more important in the war against organized crime as a, as a person to provide um, uh, information, background information and testimony in other cases than merely a witness against John Gotti. If John Gotti, if Gravano testifies, as I assume he will, and if in fact, if in fact there's a conviction, uh, what will it do to the family? I don't know, but can I go back to that last question? Yeah, you can. They, they want John Gotti almost as bad as they wanted to win the Persian Gulf. I, I don't think anybody answered your question. Yeah. I think they want him very badly. He's thumbed his nose at the government. He's beaten them three times. He's become a bit of a folk hero. People talk about him in the street. Uh, uh, as a folk hero? Yes. They write letters to him. Uh, they, he wins polls on television programs and, and on and on. And they write letters to newspaper reporters saying yeah. how, how good a, a guy he is. You get and, those kinds of letters? Oh, uh, constantly. So I mean, yeah. every from week. From the neighborhood? Or from just... people in the neighborhood. I mean, a lot, look, to but be honest. But that's always been true, has it not? Well, no, no, no. It hasn't quite always been that true. No, I get letters every week from people telling me that the government is persecuting John Gotti. I get letters from people, you know, telling me that, you know, why don't you write about how come they're keeping John Gotti in jail yes, without bail of for 11 months. Of course they want, you know, they want, him. They want him badly. He's no. beaten them badly many three of, times in a row. Many of the letters, though, are form letters, and they're the same letters I get you know, week yeah. after week, and they've been Xerox copies. So I don't know how many original people get original yeah. thoughts mm -hmm. to write me letters. Does it make a lot of difference that Bruce Cutler is not on this case? Well, he's in a no-lose position right now. I mean, Bruce, Bruce mm. Cutler can't lose anymore. Yeah. I mean, he... He was the architect of three successive victories, and no matter what happens now, uh, Bruce Cutler is the biggest winner. But what about Gotti? In other words, is Gotti in a more vulnerable position, regardless of who the new lawyer is, because of this thing he had with Cutler? I think they had something unusual, the yeah. two of them. There's no question about what it. What was it? Um, I don't know, but uh, they seemed to walk together. They seemed to know what each was going to do. Um, I, th I think... Uh, Bruce yeah. fed off him, and he fed off Bruce. Yeah, there's no sense. question. I've that. never seen a, a situation where a client and an attorney uh, mesh the way the two of them do. You have done as much as anybody, uh, probably have reported more on this in terms of, certainly in terms of television. Have you had any success in getting to Gotti at all? I've had and conversations with him. I've seen you on the where he him, sort of brushes uh, you. Um, you know, but I mean, if you sit and talk to John Gotti like this, it's fine. If you sit and with a camera, with a camera, and try and talk to John Gotti, it's a very different thing. Uh, in that respect, he's a very private person. But when you sit and talk like this, you're talking about baseball. You're talking about uh, whatever was in the papers. You're not talking about crime. If you raise the question of crime, what happens? Maybe he'll make a joke about it. But I mean, there's no earnest discussion about it. You know, there's a company line there. I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. And that's the company line. Let me go back to the question of what happens if Gotti is convicted because of Gravano's testimony. What does that do to this family and to the other organized crime families? Well, I think does it, it start it, unraveling? I don't know whether, it, I think it might be too soon to say that it's unraveling. I think that um, certainly the family, all five families in New York have had their operations impeded by the convictions of the last few years, but it really hasn't affected life in the street, life in certain industries where organized crime has predominated, or at least organized crime has had some sort of effect and impact. And I think that uh, you have to remember that you know there are, in that family there are probably three or four hundred members. Someone will replace Gotti. Someone will, play, will, will replace Gravano. Maybe they won't be effective. Maybe there will be some sort of disunity within the family, and there'll be maybe a, a war within the family. But you know, if there's a if there's an organized crime element controlling a certain union or a certain industry, and it's run by that family, it's going to continue to be run that way, uh, because the capo on the street is going to go to work every day and run his industry or run his his rackets. And until you go down to that level and you start taking out those people and you start, you start rooting out the corruption in these industries and the, uh, the, the, the corruption that has been there uh, for decades now, uh, you're not really going to have an impact. The government is not going to have a real impact. Do you agree with the characterization of how strongly the government is trying to get Gotti? And oh, how, uh, yeah, there's no question about that. And yeah. does it bother you as a former prosecutor that Gotti has this reputation as a kind of folk hero, the way he dresses, the way he carries himself, and the fact that he's beaten the case against him three times? 
Well, it doesn't bother me in the sense that he didn't beat me. Was, yeah. My office yeah. never prosecuted yeah. him. Um, I thought that the I thought that at least two of the prosecutors. But I know a lot of prosecutors would be offended by the notion of someone that they've tried so hard to get is being characterized as a folk hero. Well, I don't know. Jerry and I have gone back and forth on this a number of times, and uh, Jerry feels that he is a, a folk hero, and that large percentage of the people in the Italian American communities really sort of revere John Gotti. And I think that it's a much smaller segment of the communities. I think it's a very vocal and outspoken segment of the communities, but I think it's a it's a very negligible percentage of, of it's the. It's a lot bigger. Uh, it's a lot bigger. I think yeah. it's a lot Thirty-six bigger. jurors in a row. That's yeah. Well, but that's that, but said what? that's quite a. Oh, yeah, oh you but, said not guilty. But that doesn't say they revere him. That just says that the government went to bat with really weak cases, like really poor cases. In in two instances, and in, in the in the case in New York County, I think there was good lawyering. Good yeah. lawyering got him off on a on a case that was really a close call. Yeah. But I don't think that means that because 36 people said not guilty, that people in the in the Italian American communities in this city revere John Gotti. No, I don't either. I I, I don't. I don't think that the Italian American community reveres John Gotti. I think in some communities, like Ozone Park, he is a hero. I mean, uh, in, in Howard Beach, perhaps he's a hero. I don't think the entire Italian American community uh, loves and adores. How John did they Gotti. get these tapes? Well, they put they put several bugs in and in, in, in and about the uh, Ravenite Social Club on Mulberry right. Street. Uh, what they did was, and it's, it's interesting, is that they had a, ta a bug in the Ravenite Social Club proper. Uh, which really wasn't which working so well, club. right on on Mulberry Street. That bug wasn't really working so well. But John Gotti didn't know that, and he went outside the Ravenite upstairs to an apartment and in a hallway where they had bugs that were working pretty well. And I'm told that the the more damaging tapes occur, conversations occur in those hallway conversations and in the conversations up in the apartment above the Ravenite. I don't know exactly how the FBI uh, breaks into. Uh, uh, into uh, apartments, uh, especially on Mulberry Street, uh, which is a pretty uh, closed community, to put the bugs in. But uh, however they did it, it you know, had to be something. Yeah, and had to go in more and the once. tapes are every bit as important as Emmy. Oh, the Bold of Honor. Far, far more important. They're nearly useless without each other. Yeah. Oh, I disagree with um, you. I think but, it, well, yeah. if, you, if you're talking about decoding them and all that, I would say that the tapes are the killer tapes and they should have stopped there and making a deal was foolish. But remember, we're Would dealing you say that? I would, but yeah. remember, in reality, we're dealing with the experience we've seen in uh, in the uh, Gene Gotti case and in other cases in the in the State Gotti case, where you say, "Well, tapes don't lie," yeah. and then clever defense lawyers get up and they do their best, and by the time they're finished, you're sitting there in the same courtroom, having heard the same tapes with the transcript yeah. in front of you, saying, "Yeah, but that tape doesn't really say this." Yeah. You know, the hand is quicker than the eye or something, yeah, but, but it worked, and it worked two or three times. And even in, is, even in cases of videotape, not just audio tape. No, but the difference is, it's not so much video. If you have somebody on videotape, that's per, usually the end of the story. Well, I, 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 yeah, yeah, I know, but... <laughs> but, uh, yeah. but one of the things, in the, in the New York County case, they had tapes, but the audibility was atrocious. Yeah. From what I understand, the audibility in this case, the, the, the audibility is excellent. In, yeah. in this case, too, one fact that seems to uh, get lost every day is that a judge who is not one of the strictest, most conservative judges in the world, Leo Glasser, has listened to these tapes and found that they prove beyond a doubt that John Gotti is a danger to the community because he kills people and he obstructs justice. And he has kept him in jail without bail for 11 months now. Now, Leo Glasser is not the most conservative judge. He's, a, you know, re relatively liberal. He makes the government work for its convictions, and uh, he uh, doesn't let them get away with a lot of stuff that other judges do. He's not a government judge. Let me just go around the circle here. What's the biggest misconception about organized crime in America? Hmm. Biggest misconception? Yeah. Isn't it uh, probably that it's as big as it is, I would guess. Well, I think just the I think the biggest misconception right now we've got because we have two years in a row, the New York Times has written stories saying that the mob is dead. Yeah, the mob is dead. I think is that it's alive and well and kicking. Uh, there's and, no question and that, that it's alive and well. And whenever somebody's knocked off, someone else steps up to steps replace them. Steps up the structure of organized crime, the Italian American organized yeah. crime, the mafia is so ingrained that and so well, and the tradition is so goes back so long that uh, it's going to take another and we'll 10, 20, 30 years. And will continue even if Gotti years. goes to jail. No question about it. What's the biggest I think probably the misconception is the, the Hollywood uh, glorification or glamorization of the mafia. I think that uh, 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 that it isn't like that at all. I think that these people are, are thugs. Uh, they're very brutal. 
Um, uh, they're greedy, and they're not. Uh, they could be charming on certain levels, but uh, when it comes to business, these people are very uh, brutal, despicable people. John, I think the biggest misconception that is borne out now is this omerta, the oath of silence. I think yeah. that is a part of mob history because it is clearly gone. And that seems to be a, a looming threat, does it not? Especially if Gravano. Absolutely. And it's a domino effect. I mean, in the commission case, when the bosses all got sentenced to 100 years, yeah. and then they had trials before that where they were sentenced to 100 years, you take a guy in his 30s and 40s in a significant organized crime position who says, 100 years? Have you got a minute? That's a long time. <laughs> Can we talk? If I did 15, I could, I could be out when I'm 50-something years old. I have a life to live after that. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's weighing heavily, especially when they see the other yeah. lesser lights uh, rolling over and having success. Michael yeah. Francis is making movies about himself. He yeah. got arrested today. Yeah. Yeah. For what? Yeah. Uh, some financial indiscretion. All right, one, I'm, I'm over, out of time here. Now, with respect to Gravano, he will go into, uh, he is now, and will go into witness protection, correct? That's correct, yeah. What would be the threat to his family, if any? His, his family personal family has elected to stay behind so far, yeah. which is very unusual. And if, in fact, have said what a stupid thing he's done, yeah. if, if what I read in the paper, at least. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right, Jerry. Well, that's what I—that's what I read today. Also, uh, I don't know if they've gone quite that far as to say what a stupid thing he's done. But as of now, they're not in the—you uh, know—they're not in the witness protection program, and uh, you never know if if Sammy Bull does testify for the government. They may testify for the defense. Who knows? Uh, I, I got to ask this: if, if you were representing Sammy the Bull and he came to you and said, "This is what I'm going to do," what would you say to him? I would have said, "That's your choice, fine." That's all. You wouldn't have uh, said, "You're about to get a crash course on acting. They're going to take you into studio equity and drill you for 90 <laughs> days and get you ready." <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all. Pleasure to have you. We'll be back and we'll talk about first the trial of reputed mob boss John Gotti is coming to a head in a Manhattan federal court. The prosecution star witness, Gotti underboss, Salvatore Sammy the Bull Gravano, took the stand today. His testimony is expected to include Gotti's involvement in the rub-out of his predecessor, Gambino family boss Paul Castellano. Joining us now for an update on the testimony and their predictions are Ed McDonald. He is a former federal prosecutor, now defense attorney, defense attorney Gerald Lefcourt, and John Miller of WNBC Television News in New York. John Miller is coming. He should be here in just a few minutes. Uh, joining us also is David Lewis, a well-known defense attorney who has been on this broadcast before, and we're pleased to have all of you. And when John comes, we'll have him join us. Uh, he was there at the trial and give us some sense of, of what happened during that trial and, and the mood and the atmosphere. Uh, let me just start with you, Gerald Lefcourt. Uh, tell me what Gravano and the significance of Gravano's testimony. It is on the front page of Tuesday's New York Times. Close confidant of Gotti testifies of Mafia family's violent reign, describes in detail a plot to murder Castellano. Here is Sammy the Bull takes the tan, digging Gotti's grave. God, Godfather's ex-underboss tells how they plan rub out of Castellano. Uh, well, at, from the government's point of view, he's taken the stand and said, I was number two in this Gambino organized crime family, and he was the boss, John Gotti, that is, and uh, I was at planning meetings uh, when uh, the killing of Paul Castellano was discussed. I even met with shooters right. who actually did the shooting. But the, problem, that, but the problem that uh, is, is easily foreseen is that prior to Sammy the Bull becoming a government witness, the government's whole case and the other star witness, who is no longer now even a witness perhaps, was a person who was an innocent bystander on the street who was going to testify that John Gotti was on a street corner saying, what happened to those guys? And he identified Gotti as being on the street corner. Now Sammy the Bull gets on the stand and says, I was on the inside of the family. Right. And he wasn't on any street corner. Rather, we were in a car nearby. driving around yeah. nearby. Now, it's a direct contradiction of what the whole government's case was before. I'm sure that this is something that's going to be exploited by the defense, because now this guy comes in who has a motive, by the way, from the defense point of view, at least that's what they've been arguing, uh, to kill all these people who were charged with being the victims or the, or the intended victims of murder, namely Sammy the Bull, who is probably going to be, uh, you know, portrayed as a lunatic. Is that you have represented people accused of being members of organized crime, correct? I have. And so, David Lewis, have you been represented people I accused have. of being members of organized crime? You have, and you probably will in the future. Uh, let me just raise this question. If you are the defense attorney, and you're representing someone like John Gotti in this case, and you've got someone with the credentials of Mr. Uh, Gravano, who is going to testify against your client, uh, 
and the prosecution is stepping forward to say, yes, he has admitted 19 murders, and, and yes, this is a guy who is no better than John Gotti, uh, but we want you to believe him because we've got tapes and we've got his testimony. What do you have to do to discredit Gravano? Well, there are two problems. First, you've got to make sure that Gravano is far worse than any defendant in the courtroom by virtue of the acts he admits and acts that he has concealed from you the You as a defense attorney have to Absolutely. do that. Absolutely. That's the first goal. The second goal is that while Gravano is going to say many things that the tapes mirror, there's an awful lot that the government wants from Gravano that they can't prove with the tapes. And so it's a little like the cross-examination is going to set up the argument that a guy comes in and says, I killed a grizzly bear with a pencil. Here, Charlie, here's the pencil. Well, that's not enough proof. And the two issues are what's real, what's made up, and whether or not what Gravano is so taints the courtroom that the jury can't convict anyone because Gravano is just so bad. And you're a former prosecutor, now defense attorney, and your job is to use. John Miller, come on in. John Miller from WNBC. Good to have you here. Uh, we are underway with a conversation about uh, what Gravano did. Let me switch first to John. Uh, tell me about this day in court, John. I mean, how the mood and, and what Gravano said as we well, give you a chance to put your mic on. I think uh, without burying the lead, what Gravano said was he was in the car with John Gotti, standing by for Big Paul Castellano to be murdered. Um, Prior to that, of course, the whole lead-up to it was the history of his becoming a gangster, becoming a made member of the family, and then first being approached by Gotti's camp to gain his political support within the family to murder their own boss. What, what, now set up the mood for me. That's the testimony. What did, did John Gotti stare at him? Did Gravano avoid looking at Gotti? What was the... This was truly high noon. Um, I mean, this has been a trial that's already a month in progress, uh, playing all kinds of tapes, tapes of Gotti and Gravano talking in secret in this uh, location where the FBI had their bugs. So to actually see Sam Gravano sit up on the witness stand and stare straight past John Gotti as Gotti was drilling him with those eyes, trying to catch his eye, trying to stare him down, an entire front row of assorted made members of the Gambino crime family, family members, supporters, yeah. hang around guys, all staring at Gravano, uh, trying to turn up the heat. Um, when they called for Gravano, the door's supposed to open, he's supposed to come in, there was a full four minutes that went by from wherever they had him hidden down whatever hallway in whatever bunker before he was produced. You could have heard a pin drop during that entire time. It was uh, certainly the climax of the trial so far. Yeah, and the most important thing that Gravano said was that he was in the car and, with he Gotti puts and that John Gotti, Gotti at the murder scene. And does he put in John Gotti's mouth, "Kill Paul Castellano"? He he puts in John Gotti's mouth and in the mouths of John Gotti's cronies through a series of meetings, the uh, intricate planning and uh, politicking that went up to the murder at yeah. Gotti's behest. If you are the prosecutor, put yourself in that position again. What do you have to do to, to in a sense, take this man and make his testimony believable despite what the defense is going to do in order to destroy his credibility and say to that jury, you can't believe this man because of who he is? Well, first of all, you have to realize that the, that the defense is a serious problem here in cross-examining uh, Gravano. Cross-examination of Gravano was going to be based on two things. Uh, one is his motive to lie, to, to make a better deal for himself. But secondly, they want to bring out all of his bad acts, his whole career of crime, his 19 murders, uh, the fact that he's just totally reprehensible and just a disgusting human being. But the problem is, is that the jury has already listened to four weeks of tape-recorded conversations. And in most of those conversations, John Gotti is speaking to his constant companion, Sammy Gravano. So the jury is going to say, if, if Sammy Gravano was so bad, what is John Gotti doing hanging around with him? They have to say to themselves, well, you know, what he says makes, makes some sense. There's a ring of truth here because these people are constantly together. The things that they're talking about, I mean, after a while, it begins to just pile up. You know, when they're talking about whacking somebody, I mean, they can argue from now until the cows come home that, you know, when they were saying whack, they meant something else. But after, after four weeks of constant conversation after conversation with but the But Ed, jury, how are they, they going to explain the fact that their whole case was based on a so-called innocent that's, bystander? That's, okay, how did they get this guy to say that? They, all right, now Before that's Before they had Gravano. Let me, I mean, right, don't you think I'll about well, this? Explain <laughs> what you mean by innocent bystander. Somebody got some person who was not involved in the oh, yeah, family, yeah, yeah, yeah. just somebody on the street 
to place John Gotti on the street. How does the government get somebody to say that? But wait a minute. Right, right, go ahead. <laughs> that's, but but that, that wait, is wait, hold on. Okay. Let's, let me, so he, this guy puts him on 2nd Avenue, and Gravano has him on 3rd Avenue. In a car, though. In a, in, a, in a car, and he had him on the street. That, right. that could be a One critical problem for the government. Well, One of them's got to be lying. <laughs> I even and got the, that, but, David. But, but, <laughs> the point is, but the point is that it opens up Gravano to the idea that even a story about an event that he says he was part of is completely fabricated. So uh, how do you, how can you this is Tell him how. No, I'm not going to tell him how because I'm going <laughs> to say there's a problem that the government has here. And it looks as if the government has been, and I haven't seen, I haven't been present in the courtroom, and I've been following what I'm reading in the newspapers, and obviously the newspapers and the television are focused on the, on the Castellano murder. And, but it, is, it appears that the government has fallen into this almost of a trap where they're making the Castellano murder the centerpiece of their case, it was sort of the be-all and the end-all. And if they're doing that and they're disregarding the other predicate crimes, you have to remember there are five or six other murders involved in this case, and the proof on those could well, be very, very substantial. Sammy Gravano rather than John Gotti. Yeah, but John though. Gotti is admitting doing them right on the, on, the, on the tape. He's admitting that he's saying Sammy came and asked me to do it. And other ones, you know, he, that, that Sammy Gravano was not involved in, 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 in asking that he be executed. You know, the, the, uh, the, the Di Bernardo murder, and, and, there's, the, the, and there's two other ones in which he was involved. But they can't, well, I think that the government should really be focusing the jury's attention on the other cases, on the other murders, on the other crimes that are predicate crimes. They only have to have two predicate crimes in order to convict Gotti on the RICO count. They don't have to prove Paul Castellano murder. It's a predicate murder. crime. But the RICO um, statute requires that you prove that the defendant participated in a pattern of racketeering okay. activity, and, the racketeer and that pattern has to include two or more predicate that felonies. That statute is a statute which sort of ends the notion of fair trial in this country. For instance, uh, could William Kennedy Smith have been acquitted if they were allowed to bring in all those other allegations of similar yeah. conduct? Right. Wouldn't the jury have ended up saying to themselves, oh, he must be guilty of one of them, so let's convict him? And that's what the RICO statute is. It sort of ends the notion that a jury can sit and focus on, did he do that? beyond yeah. a reasonable doubt because they throw so many things into yeah. the trial that they come away with saying, oh, I must have done so. Yeah. What's the most interesting question to you in all of this? In all of which? The Gra Gravano turning against Gotti and his testimony. I mean, obviously one big question is whether the jury will convict him, but beyond that, the interplay of these personalities, what is just the most interesting? I, I think that it's so interesting that John Gotti has always portrayed himself, and we have essentially bought him as uh, the canny gangster, you know, the ultimate gangster, uh, the real gangster with the street sense, where are the other guys that tried to simulate themselves as businessmen. Um, it shows that his judgment in picking a backup, uh, a guy that he considered was an excellent street boss, yeah. is uh, extremely poor. That's interesting to me, too, because there is, in, in one story I read, where guy, somebody suggested that Sammy the Bull Gravano has been accused or maybe has acknowledged that he killed his best friend and rubbed out, uh, whacked, whacked his best friend. And that when Gotti saw that and heard about that, assuming that all these things are true, that Gotti should have known that if he'd do that, what might he do to me at some point if somebody gets to him? The interesting thing about this thing well, to me is that Gravano, according to this plea agreement, will probably be on the street in a few years. I mean, I, and here's a guy who has admitted to all of these murders. Okay, that's my second question. You know, what was the deal? Why did Gravano make the deal? Yeah. Well, he made the deal because he didn't want to die in jail. He was looking at a prison sentence of 100 years. He knew that if he were convicted in this case, which he probably okay, would Okay, but be, there are other people. Have, haven't there been other people in that position who would have gone to prison for a long time if they didn't turn against someone else in the family? Sammy they were Gravano tougher. was ultimately an Erzart's gangster. I mean, uh, he had never done any prison time. He claimed to be this tough guy. And uh, the first time he spent a few weeks in jail, right. before he was in jail a year, not even convicted, but awaiting trial, not even with the, you know, the dark horizon of spending the rest of his life, with, with the full idea that if he beat this case, he might even walk out. He approached the feds and said, what do you want to and know? He initiated the, the contact? I believe he had been offered uh, a way to approach the feds several times, and at some well, point, he said. took it's the bait. Lawyer says he, it's not a question of how the feds got to him and twisted and turned and forced him the by saying, you're going to sit in a cell him. and rot and all that no, stuff. No, the lawyer who was representing him has said publicly that he didn't even know that his client was uh, having conversations with the government, that he the reached FBI out. The FBI was sending feelers to yeah. him on a regular basis. Sure. Well, I don't know they, how they picked him as the, wink, the weak link, and they were right. And, and yeah. what is it they saw in him that made them think 
think he was the weak link. A guy who had never done time, yeah. a guy who acted real tough, who he just didn't read as really being that tough. He worked too hard at it. Yeah. Is this? Go ahead, David. The real problem is, is that Gravano gets an agreement like this, and either somebody was on Second Avenue or somebody this was third. Avenue. Avenue. So this right. is the agreement. Go ahead. That we uh, come. John brought this, I guess. Did you? Yeah. And yeah. basically, the truth's for sale. And the end result is that whether they get Gotti or not in this case, a guy like Gravano, who clearly has all these murders, is someone who, for, for everybody else, is coming to a theater near you. I mean, this guy's getting out. And he's getting out because he joined Team America at the right time. So what's wrong with that? I mean, then, then it... Because, what, you know, I mean, what's it, wrong because with that? there's a problem with reliability. When you make somebody an offer they can't refuse, whether you are the government or a mobster, yeah. it's still an offer you can't refuse. What they're saying to him is... You get out of jail if you help us convict okay. Gotti. Yeah. So he helps them are, convict Gotti. Are you two Gotti. guys saying that you don't believe Gravano because, in terms of the testimony he's going to make? I have a substantial question about Gravano not knowing anything, except that he has committed, at, by his own admission, numerous murders, committed all these deaths. And are you saying that Why should we believe him now? Yeah. I think if he's a killer, then selling the truth here, is right? a minor deal. And either, uh, my own conclusion is that if you don't believe, if you're willing to believe Gravano, and you're willing to believe the neutral eyewitness, then Gotti's able to be on two avenues at once. Well, look, I Come think on, you guys. have to remember that this was a case that, it was a case that was brought with a lot of fanfare by the FBI before Sammy Gravano ever turned. And, uh, on a different theory, apparently. Yeah. Well, no, no, no. You're, again, you're focusing only on the Castellano That's murder, true. okay? And we're talking about a case with several other predicates, and, and, and you're talking about one witness, and you're talking about a lot of other proof that's involved in the case, circumstantial evidence, and tape-recorded conversations. It was a case that the government and the FBI felt very confident of. I mean, usually you don't hear the FBI shoot their the mouths off too often about getting, get, you know, guaranteeing victories. Once in a while they fail, but in big mafia cases, nine times out of ten, they win the cases. It begs the question, if the tapes were so good, and they are, if the evidence was so strong, and it seems to be, why did they want to affect, infect, if you will, the credibility of all of that superb evidence by bringing in as their partner the most despicable character well, in the I don't, case. Know, I don't know the answer, an answer to that. Maybe... The answer is greed. The answer is prosecutors are greedy to have as much, and if it doesn't fit sometimes, then we'll sort of move the innocent neutral guy out in that one count maybe and we want as much as we can get so we can pile it all on and in a rico case if you put enough in the landfill everybody says see garbage i mean and look, that's that the happens, end of the that happens in some cases but when they pile on with that more more so yeah. it's not they have to know that john answer now. your own question why do you think they brought gravano in i think that that they are like all other people they put on a confident air, but they're basically insecure. And they're worried that the, that the tapes may not be enough. And if they've got also, something else, there was a, just a, a terrible hammer over their head. And if you ask them this, they would say it wasn't so. Right. But I, I don't mind uh, saying it for them. They could not afford to lose this case. They can't afford to lose it now. If John Gotti went up to the plate for the fourth time and hit it out of the ballpark, the feds would have to take their bats and their gloves and go home with their tails between their legs. They can't lose to a guy they've described as a cheap punk gangster four times in a row and still hold their heads but, but, but up when the raises, guy's becoming but, a folk But that hero. raises David's question, have they endangered their case because of his credibility? In, I'm not a lawyer, which is the big advantage I have at this table. I think like <laughs> one of the poor schlumps sitting on the jury. And I now wonder... With, with these tapes, with the FBI's clean seal on them, and with, with these witnesses, poor schlump civilians like me, who have no reason or motive to lie, yeah. how I'm going to be affected by this despicable character and why they have brought him here to, to taint um, th the evidence. Yeah. Now, it may be that they're just thinking, the tapes are great, but there are gaps in them. Sammy can clear up the gaps. And when there's, on the tapes. There's when there's room for interpretation, we can say, well, never mind our interpretation with our expert agent. What were you guys yeah. talking about? And he can bring that home. I've got to get to this last point. How was he as a witness? Credible in turn, just forget the history and all that, how he handled himself on the stand. He didn't come across as a terribly likable guy, although we gather he's not. Um, <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> He spoke very softly. Oh, come on. Oh, but this is the no, no, of the rehearsal. No, no, he He spoke, hasn't been on cross yet. He spoke very <laughs> softly, and, uh, and he didn't uh, go out on any limbs with explanations. He was being very cautious to give the briefest answer to the prosecutor. So, uh, so he's, he seemed to be very nervous. But it's really, it, it's so early in the game. What happens here is that this witness has been uh, rehearsed 
probably 20 to 50 times before getting on the stand. And the director's going in like a script. And then all of a sudden, Cross comes. And anything could happen on Cross. David, last word. <laughs> I think we're going to see much more of what Gravano really is when Albert Krieger gets up to cross-examine. Is Krieger pretty good? Krieger excellent. is excellent. He may be the greatest cross-examiner ever. Ever? Ever. <laughs> Didn't know that. Wow. All right. That, stay tuned. Thank you all. Pleasure to have you. We'll, you. we'll be right back. Stay with us. First, in a federal courtroom, the trial of reputed mob boss John Gotti continues. Testifying for the prosecution, former Gotti underboss Sammy the Bull Gravano has detailed all 19 murders he himself took part in. Joining me now to tell us if this is the end for Gotti and what it may mean for organized crime are New York Newsday columnist Jimmy Breslin and John Miller from WNBC News. Welcome. You were in the courtroom today. Give me a sense of, of uh, what Gravano said today. I think what they were trying to do was to elicit uh, from Gravano the laundry list of all the things the mob can do. So the questioning bounced from, did you kill this guy and this guy and this guy, to did you fix this guy's case? How did you get to the member of the jury, you know, to which the jurors leaned forward to hear? Uh, well, it was the fish store across the street. The guy's daughter worked there, and uh, I suggested a gift of $10,000 would be appropriate, Gravano said. Then they moved on. How do you shake down the construction industry? What kind of money is it worth? How much does Gotti get? How much do you get? Uh, they moved on through, uh, how do you decide as a mobster which guys are allowed to plead guilty and which guys have to, uh, have to uh, fight it out? Who can uh, get contempt in a grand jury and how does the boss decide? They really wanted to give the jury an overview of how involved it all is. Now that they've gotten through Gravano's eyewitness account of a couple of major mob hits, they wanted to show them around the store a little. How is he doing as a witness? I mean, what's the, is there a kind of consensus among smart what, you know, courthouse types. He's doing very well as a witness, but he's in the easy part now. You know, they they are pitching him the the grounders, and he's you know uh, throwing them back. I think uh, on cross examination, which uh, will begin uh, tomorrow, that'll be his real challenge. But uh, his presence is very low key, and uh, to his credit, credibility wise, when he doesn't know something or can't remember, he doesn't fudge it. He says, "I don't know." Yeah. What do you think of this, Jimmy? I think. Uh out of 100, 88 uh, people, 88 percent, are absolutely certain that Gotti's gone. I mean, he might as well stay in jail. Out of, there's, out of only 12, there's only 12 more votes to count, yes. and then he'll be gone for sure. I mean, it's unanimous. He looks like he's gone, and it's up to the jury. Uh, Gravano, as he talks and tells the story, there's one very bad thing about his testimony. And then it sounds like the truth, yeah. which is the worst thing of all. That's worse than the murder is the fact that guys tell the they, truth. in fact, did it. Uh, yeah, he sounds like he's telling the truth, and I think they might have a tough time with him if he yeah. is. I mean, where he was saying, you know, where he says, I don't know, yeah. uh, that's bad. What you, does it you remind you of? I mean, give me a kind of uh, Breslin look at this guy. I never guy. saw anybody. Oh, this guy? Yeah. Well, he's got to be a bed bug, huh? Yeah. And, uh, uh, that, that he was paying a guy to spar with him and, and to look good as a fighter. He's a 40-year-old guy trying to learn how to use his hands in the gym. And uh, with the guy, Eddie V, that, that boxed yeah, the man right. a couple this of is times. How he led the column, and yes. he, he, uh, But he paid him. Yeah. Like he walked in with the two guys walked into the gym. There's a great big guy and there's a little Gravano. Yeah. So V, you go, you got, don't think that the big guy is the big shot. It's the little guy is the big one. He's the one that pays. <laughs> yes. And he, he never hit him back. He just boxed him and never hit him. Now, yeah. one thing about prize fighting, there are two parts to it. One is that you hit the guy, and the other is that sometimes he hits back, and it now is up to you. Can you take that punch? Well, Sammy never had the, he, the thrill of, uh, of uh, fear getting into that sphere. They never hit him. Yeah. In fact, he boxed with a heavyweight well, Sipes. Who didn't hit him? I yeah. mean, he just wanted. Uh, so there's something the matter with him from the go, if you're doing yeah. that. Yeah, and maybe that's a link to the fact that, that, that we have talked about on this broadcast mm -hmm. before that mm -hmm. he decided to turn government witness because he'd never really been to prison, had he not? He and so therefore, he, time. the same thing. He hadn't he been hit, he's never punch. been inside. He never was inside at all. Yeah. Huh? Well, he never was in a fight. Let me take a look at this. is from time. John Miller on WNBC television in New York, a piece that he put together about Sammy Gravano and who he is and how he got sure, to where he is. Take a look. There was no one closer to mob boss John Gotti than this man, Sam Gravano. Known to fellow mobsters as Sammy the Bull, Gravano was the alleged underboss to Gotti of the Gambino family, the largest crime family in the United States. 
News 4 has learned exclusively that Gravano has turned canary. He will be the star witness for federal prosecutors at the Gotti trial, the trial where he was supposed to be the second defendant. The idea that Gotti's own underboss would testify against him, under oath, in open court, sent shockwaves through mob circles. Lawyers didn't believe it, mobsters didn't believe it, but it's true. Ironically, Gravano was promoted from the position of consigliere, or advisor to the boss, to Gotti's underboss, so he could run the family after Gotti was in jail. Hidden FBI microphones actually recorded Gotti asking Gravano which job title he would want. So I'm asking you, how do you want to sing this movie here? Or you want me to make you official underboss, acting boss? How do you feel? What makes you feel better? What made Gravano feel better after Gotti was arrested ended up not mattering too much. Gravano was arrested with Gotti. And like Gotti, he's been in jail without bail ever since. Federal sources confirm that the FBI delivered a letter from Sammy Bull to his defense lawyer, Ben Braffman, on Friday. The letter said Braffman was fired and that Gravano would no longer need his services for the trial. I had absolutely no hand in it whatsoever. I had no advanced knowledge that he had had any contact with the government of any kind. The letter came as a complete uh, surprise and a complete shock. And uh, quite frankly, I don't know what his true status is at this time. I haven't been able to contact him. Back to the point you made. Do you think most people you know think that Gotti, that, that this is really the case against Gotti and that with this kind of testimony, notwithstanding the credibility of Gravano, uh, the conventional wisdom is that this is it? Yeah, but it's up to the jury, which yeah. is why I'm, I'm uh, quoting it so authoritatively. 88. Everybody, he's gone. I mean, it's the jury. Yeah. I don't see how you can say anything until they come in. And Make, you know the experience we've all had uh, predicting juries. Yes, you never yeah. predict what they're going to do, and you keep your mouth shut if you've got any. If you want to look smart, if you yeah. want to look dumb, go and say what they're yeah. going to do. I mean, typically we would stand in the hallway in a big case, and between the lawyers and the prosecutors yeah. and the courtroom experts, it's all settled. We yeah, would right. all we would right. all say, right. well, clearly these are the issues right. they're wrestling with, and right. it just hangs on that. And ultimately, when you finally talk to the jurors, it wasn't that at all. It was they they never discussed that. Yeah. You know. I, I was thinking that I saw Lee Bailey in the courtroom yesterday. Uh, he came to Queens County. He's representing some witness, isn't he, or something? Yeah. Went, okay. He was there. He came to court in Queens County for two brothers on a murder, and the, uh, he went around the courthouse for a long time before giving out books and autographing so all the courtroom people would be formed, the marshals right. and the, the uh, court officers and everything. He gets me in the hallway when the jury is coming in, and he said, we're getting a verdict, and I'm told I'm not going to like it. And the two defendants he had were very rank. We're not going to behave well. Two tough guys. And he had one hand under the table when the jury came in. To, so he knew enough to follow his hand underneath the table because they were going to go nuts, the two guys with yeah. him. The guy stood up. Death warmed over the jury. They were, you know, they looked. All they needed was a rope. And he said, not guilty. Bailey just went like this. He went out. <laughs> and he says, I'll never talk again as long as I live. He couldn't believe it. Yeah. So therefore, I don't see how you can just stand around. As John says, you can get very smart in the hallway. Yeah. Still the case. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's like a joke. It's like an FBI guy sat yeah. down when he retired and said, I don't know, if I could have made up a case out of my head, I mean, I would have wanted a bug in his secret meeting room that was clear. I would have wanted another bug in his clubhouse. And uh, as a witness, I think... Uh, I'll take the underboss. Where does the defense see that they can make some inroads on this? It's very tough to cross-examine those tapes. Um, you know, they can scream all they want. They're taken out of context. But you'll get a lot further cross-examining a guy who admits to 19 murders uh, than you will with a, with a piece of tape recording. This is their big chance right now. And what is Gravano like when he talks about the murders? I mean, is it matter-of-factly? Yeah. Is it just, I, 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 I whacked him, I whacked him, I whacked much, him, I whacked much him. Much the way you and I would say, I waxed the car, and then uh, I went to the store. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And does anybody raise the question of, of how could you do that, or, or what were you thinking about? or Not the prosecutor, but you can bet the defense will. Yeah. I mean, remember, we're talking about a guy, not that John Gotti came to him and said, kill this guy, kill this guy, kill this guy. We're talking about Sammy Gravano, who killed, in, in various orders, uh, his best friend and brother-in-law, then his new best friend, Louis Melito. Right. And when Louis Melito's daughter came to him and said, my father's missing, he said, if anything ever happened, if my car broke down, if I needed money, anything, and I couldn't find him to come to you, and he said, sweetheart, I'll look around for him, I'll, I'll get back to you. Idiot. He just finished murdering him. Uh, Louis de Bono, his other business partner, um, 
uh, Frankie Batts, a member of his own crew. And why did he kill all these people? Um, three of them were business disagreements, and one of them he was concerned. The guy had started using drugs, and he thought he might be unreliable. That's his story. So uh, some of it was business, uh, some of it was personal, but uh, it was him going to Gotti and saying, I need clearance to kill these guys. Why are we so fascinated by this? And I mean, you're writing columns about it. I'm doing television programs, and John's out there covering it every day. I don't know. It, it certainly doesn't have much to do with what's going no, on. No, it doesn't. Huge, but we're all sort of captured but every, by well, this. Well, it's notion. good. It's, it's an imitation of the movies. Yeah. You can't make a movie out of this because it's so small and tawdry. These are street corner bums, pool hall, uh, loan sharking. Crap games, uh, nothing of any... Uh, but there that's is the there most is. incredible thing, because you know and I know that these guys are bums off uh, the street. Nothing. Then when you examine yeah. it and say, who controls the Carpenters yeah. Union in New York? Yeah. Who controlled, yeah. until, yeah. until recently, may still, the concrete industry? Who controlled the window replacement business? Two dollars a window, billions of windows in the city. Yeah. Who controls all of these major, major businesses, the trucking industry and the garment center? Um, that is different. Those fellas are different that had uh, the trucks. The classier that's, end that's a, of the They've spectrum. had money for over 50 years. That, yeah, but the, the influence the Gambino is who, oh, who, 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 who plea bargained and said they'd get out of the business that's and all there, that. You're moving. So, but they're they're the ones, that's the movie. Why? But John Gotti is still their boss. Yeah. yeah. And because, he still gets a piece of the Because the bottom party. line in the business is they shoot. That's yeah. why that Sammy must have a, a, be the number two guy with Gotti, because the Gotti's afraid he'd kill him. Yeah. I guess Sammy apparently shot and killed everybody in New York except himself. Yeah, but see, the interesting thing about it is it's been brought out before. Why would Gotti choose someone? Assuming Fear. He the only reason anybody does anything. Fear and also that he's a, the, yeah. obviously a bed bug, an imbecile, and he's not going to be a threat to yeah, me Yeah, but so much here's, right? it's, yeah. it's still, we're talking about this kind of power that these people have. Power? Yet at the same time, when you see them and, and listen to them, they don't seem that they have the kind of uh, wherewithal to, no. to be that no. smart. I don't, I don't think they can run a candy store, this group. I think that the so others fear. he's talking about were well, the trucking with the Gambino. These are the guys in the fashion district. That's, that's another story. That's another story. Because the cement was Tony Salerno, which is another story, too. Right. Fact, Tony. Yeah. But it's that's a critical another. theory, because here Tommy Gambino was on trial. Mm. Uh, it looked like he was probably going to win in that case because of the, the case dynamics. Mm. Here was John Gotti on trial, and it looked like he was probably going to mm. lose. But Tommy Gambino never even took the chance. He forks over $12 million, mm. gives up uh, a portion of his trucking industry, takes one foot out of the garment center because I think the simple math is, wait a minute, if it's 90 to 1 that John Gotti is going away for 100 years, why do I want to be doing time even in some, sure. you know, I should be there, you know, to either and become to the take new over boss. In, in case Gotti goes away. Right. Yeah. Or, or to yeah. get some kind of good profitable yeah. footing here. Retire What's the, into the scene. I money. read the stories of jury tampering. I mean, how do they close that opportunity down here? Oh, I don't know. Where they, how do you ever close it? There's 12 human beings They've and they know a lot of people. two jurors in two days. Two jurors in two days. One today. Yes. One sure. yesterday. Sure. Why? Uh, shrouded in yeah. secrecy, uh, this judge, Anybody. who's not a First Amendment buff, has sealed the record. But uh, wh what we've learned from our sources is that one juror's girlfriend kept approaching authorities uh, with her perceived fears that uh, either she was being followed or threatened or something, and they investigated it, decided that there was no substance, but they said, you know, she may upset this juror, and that may sway him. Let's pull him out. Mm -hmm. And they did. Now, just as suddenly, another d d juror disappears uh, today. He, um, you know, that person's been pulled out uh, with no explanation. So y you see it, it's always bubbling under the surface. You always know some. It's, uh, it's, the world is not large. If you put 12 people into a jury box, how many, 16? 18 is it? now, 18 right? Now, down, there's to a down, down to 16. Down to 16 now. Down to 16, right? down to 16 yeah. now. You have to figure those 16 out of the 16 somewhere, someplace, to somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody. somebody who knew somebody's Absolutely. grandfather, who knew somebody's mother. Absolutely. And I mean, this jury was picked from Brooklyn, from Queens, from Long yeah. Island and Staten Island, the, the, the mob's backyard, where the mob lives, in fact. Yeah. You know, if this was a Manhattan trial and they were talking about people from the East Side or Westchester, it might yeah. be different. But it's very tough to get an Eastern District jury that is unreachable unless you really lock them down, which they've pretty well done. The point you made about, uh, about Mr. Gambino, who I guess plea bargained and, and gave up some money and some whatever commitments in order to be there in the wings in case something happens to Gotti, does it make no difference if John Gotti goes down in terms of the future of organized crime? 
uh, Joe Hines was here and he said there all these stories about organized crime getting weaker are not simply not true that there is strong you were here when he said it they're as strong as they've ever been he hung his hat on the you gambling don't, don't on too. the gambling statistics no. yeah no. I mean on that you want I mean what so they can't go into a black neighborhood they're fat middle-aged guys they get wiped out in the inside of 30 seconds you can't go into a, a black neighborhood they can't put up with a 112 pound South American who'll kill everybody wives women children doesn't care that that the, the, they can't do that where are they gonna go they've got the government on them every place else no I think it's a dying breed and the, the gambling is what what are they turning what do you mean with the gambling that this well Heinz crutch cracked down uh, on the gambling remember right before the Super no, Bowl I don't, I don't, was, I don't, that's what he told me huh? what, what he said that day was that uh, when he was in rackets uh, 15 years ago uh, yeah, the gambling right, the gambling not, take was it, X and now it was four times I, I don't know what the gambling take ever was this is 1992 I think it's very very difficult you can't tell people from John Gotti's crew to go in, onto yeah. Uh, New York Boulevard in South Jamaica because they will not come back in good shape. Uh, so I don't know where they're going to go. I don't think they're uh, anywhere near what they were, and it's, uh, I think the, the losers will be the movie business, that's all. You mean, you mean there'll be no more Bugsies to no, do? No, Bugsies is, is a what? I mean, they make movies out of bed bugs, but the, uh, it does. You can't criticize. Let It Go was great, but... Uh, Gotti movie, I don't know. How are you going to make a movie out of a, a somebody everybody knows? You'd have to wait 20 years. He'll yeah. be the new Capone. They'll make movies out of him 30 years. You mean we'll make now. a legend out of him yeah, when he wasn't a legend in, in his own time? That's right. He, uh, Capone yeah. died in uh, Alcatraz. This guy, yeah, uh, who syphilis, knows? And they'll, yes, and they'll, they'll make a big thing out of this guy yeah. years to come. How long is this trial going to go on? I would say probably another three weeks. Yeah. I think it's happening much faster than they thought. Boy, it is it ever. Yes, very fast. Yeah. Nothing like a witness that can talk a lot in one day to move <laughs> things along. Wow. Really? Uh, but, and is yeah. there general uh, a consensus that the defense attorney, without Cutler, that the defense is still strong because this guy from Miami is as good, or from Florida, is as good as they say he is? There's general consensus that John Gotti would rather have Bruce Cutler there. He said it himself. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, Al Krieger is tiptoeing around this judge who uh, is ready to hammer any defense lawyer who crosses his line in the sand. So we haven't really seen much from Al uh, yet. Okay. Thank you both. Thank Jimmy. you. Good, Good to see you again. Pleasure. Thank you, John. Thank you too.